Yeah. Uh, we're very lucky today to have Martin Ware on the couch. Thank you. As you all probably know, Martin was a founding member of Human League, on the, did the first two albums, then formed Heaven 17, and then went on to form BEF, a.k.a. the British Electronic Foundation. Electric Foundation. Electric yeah. Foundation, producing a whole swathe of artists from uh, Tina Turner to Terence Trent Darby via Shaka Khan, Khan and maybe Staples, so a yeah. whole heap of people. Billy Preston. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I thought a kind of interesting starting point really would just be the kind of observation that your whole career has been about or seems to be about avoiding nostalgia. Do you think that's a good starting point for an artist? Um, started out as a futurist, I suppose, is the, uh, the way to put it. And uh, in those days, that used to be a fashion statement uh, in Sheffield, where I grew up. Uh, there wasn't much about the present that was worth having, to be honest. So the future was always where we wanted to be. And um, as I was explaining in another interview yesterday, the, the whole point being that <clears throat> I was stuck in a town of half a million people where all the industry had been destroyed by Thatcher's Britain, basically. Uh, the, there were, used to be 80,000 people working in the steelworks, and then it's, it dropped to 10,000 in about five years. And there's all these people uh, are unemployed. It's kind of a miserable place, but there's a very resilient attitude in the Sheffield people. And... Um, so there was lots of spare capacity in terms of warehouses and, uh, and small factories that they couldn't give away. So there were lots of bands going, Go on, I'll give you five or a month <laughs> to rehearse there. And, uh, and so therefore, everybody, rather than going out and seeing great things like you can do in London, where I live now, everybody had to make their own entertainment. So when you say everybody, who else are you talking about? Um... At that time, there was kind of a scene with Cabaret Voltaire, uh, who were our mentors, really. Bands like Clock DVA. Um, obviously, I formed the Human League around about that time. Uh, there were also bands like um, Def Leppard, believe it or not, who we played uh, the first ever, their first ever gig and our first ever gig were on the, uh, this small club in Sheffield. Um, who'd have known, uh, we just laughed at them because thought, we thought they were ludicrous and very old-fashioned. And they went on to sell, you know, 25 million albums. So what do I know? Um, I think your, your, your figure's quite high as well, isn't uh, it? It's not as, yeah, sold? only as a producer, though, really. I, don't, I mean, Heaven's MC never sold anything like that. But, um, or the, well, the Human League now do, or did, with Dare. Um, but the thing is, you know, there's a resilience about that kind of urban environment and working-class urban environment that makes you want to go out and do shit, right, rather than just go to concerts and watch people and kind of go, oh, well, you know, I can't be bothered sitting in a rehearsal room all week. Actually, that's the only thing there was to do in Sheffield at that time. So, I, mean, I think people know about kind of post-punk. They're aware that the bands that came out of the north of England at that time were part of the post-punk explosion and that there was also a kind of really important avant-garde element to what people were doing. But what about the, the kind of influence of Northern Soul? Yeah, Sheffield's a very soul city, really. Again, it's part of that. Um, the two major driving forces in Sheffield musically were soul and northern soul, which for you people who don't understand is a different kind of soul. It's more dance-orientated. Um, to be honest, uh, these, the original all-nighters were northern soul events. People used to take giant amounts of amphetamines and uh, take a box of seven-inch singles and go and swap singles, rare uh, soul singles from America in these grimy northern towns. It's quite interesting, really. Um, America symbolised glamour and uh, an escapism from this kind of reality that we were, we were stuck in. And uh, so there was soul was a very important thing. And also glam generally. I mean, kind of Sheffield was always a big, uh, big town for bands like Rock's Music, David Bowie, um, and even things like the, the kind of American influence in terms of glam, like New York Dolls, bands like Suicide, and, uh, you know, that kind of, uh, kind of grimy glam. I, don't, I can't really describe it, but it was always very, very it kind of appealed to the soul of Sheffield young people, you know. So the kind of bands you're talking about there were Roxy Music, spe mu Roxy music specifically. Yeah. You went to see them quite a few times live, didn't you? Yeah, I'd, I kind of... Uh, me and my friends were 
kind of cheats, really. We, we forged students' union cards. We weren't students. We were actually had to go and work because our families were very poor. But we forged student union cards and got into all these free gigs that were at Sheffield University. Sheffield's got 40,000 students. It's a big student town. So before uh, Rocks Music actually released anything, uh, their first single, we saw Rocks Music with Brian Eno before... Uh, three times in Sheffield for free. It was fantastic. And in fact, I remember going to one free gig where um, on the same gig, there was, uh, uh, it was a day-long festival. There was Roxy Music, who were the kind of headline act. There was Gary Glitter, believe it or not. There was, uh, there was Ian Dury and the Blockheads before anybody had ever released any singles of theirs or anything. There was Dire Straits, who were appalling and very boring, um, and um, people, people like Doctors of Madness. Uh, I don't know if you remember that band before your time, everybody's time. Um, but the interesting thing was it was all for free, so the people of, you know, the young people of Sheffield could, could dig this kind of eclecticism. In fact, my career is all about eclecticism and uh, trying to merge together lots of unexpected kind of uh, counterpoints in, in terms of creativity. Had you um, kind of seen or experienced or been exposed to synth- synthesizers in, in music before you saw Roxy Music? Yeah, I was kind of obsessed with synthesizers since Good Vibrations, to be honest. When I was about, I don't know, eight or nine years old, I suppose, when that record came out. And uh, like every other teenager at that time, in Europe, we used to listen to Radio Luxembourg. So it was the only radio station that played interesting music uh, and kind of brand new kind of ideas and kind of, and that was the peak time of Motown as well. So all those Motown records that incorporated synthesis, um, very early synthesis and theremin, stuff like that. It was something that always made my ears kind of prick up and, you know, I never thought in a thousand years that I'd make a career out of it, to be honest, but I had no musical training. It was just something that appealed to me a great deal. And then I always followed bands that had synthesizers in them it was just part of something that appealed to me. And then it got to the point of... Um, I was a computer operator, actually, and I, I decided that I wanted to... I had a bit of spare money for the first time in my life, and it was either learn to drive or buy a synthesizer, because they were just cheap enough to buy at that point. So I went to the local um, guitar store. that had just got the first entry-level kind of synthesizer in there. And... Um, they were all kind of rock dudes, you know. They, they didn't know anything about synthesizers. They thought we were gay because we wanted to buy a synthesizer and not want to play Stay Away to Heaven <laughs> interminably in the, in the store. Um, so, uh, anyway, we kind of overrode that, that indifference and bought synthesizer. Ian Marsh, who was also in Heaven 17, bought a synthesizer. And we just started messing around, really, and... Uh, with no intent, this is the important thing, no intention of... Uh, it wasn't like, let's get rich and be a pop star, which is the primary impetus nowadays for a lot of kids because they see the you know, American Idol, whatever. Um, we had no idea that it was possible. And that's what people kind of... It's very hard to comprehend. That, that wasn't in the air. Basically, in those days, we used, we used to go to the City Hall again, blag our way into the City Hall for free, uh, in Sheffield, uh, pretend we were part of security, uh, get in and then disappear into the crowd and watch T-Rex um, and all the big progressive acts like King Crimson. So you had a number of good blagging techniques. <laughs> we had no money, so yeah, it makes you quite creative, yeah. Um, so this first synth that you bought, what was it? It's a Korg 700S, which will mean nothing whatsoever to most of you, but uh, it was <laughs> quite funny, really. It, it was like a... Th- Three and a half octave keyboard, monophonic, so you're going to play one note at a time, no MIDI, um, some very severe filters on the front, resonated filters, which were really cool, so you can make sounds like cats dying and things like that. Um, um, very little in terms of pre I mean, there were no presets, uh, no kind of digital presets. Every button had one function, that was it, you know. Uh, so... Uh, basically, when we started doing any kind of performance, we had to write down every setting for every knob on everything and change it in between every number. And 
Do you know the, mis- the, the, the interesting thing is that the mistakes actually make it interesting? Um, and I know this is something we decided to talk about, but I should give you a, 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 an insight into the creative process at that time because we used to, or the only recording equipment we had was a reel to reel tape recorder, two track. We didn't have a mixing desk, no equalization, no effects, um, apart from the ones built into the synthesizers. And yet, we managed to, by bouncing from track to track and adding a track, adding a, a, a new instrument every time, uh, create our first, what turned out to be our first single, Being Boiled. Um, and so, all, literally, all we had was two synthesizers and a microphone and a two track tape recorder, and that was it. Um, I think later on, uh, about two months later, we managed to buy some kind of guitar pedals to try and distort the sounds of it to change it, but that was it. And so we did this, we made Being Boiled, which I'll play for you in a second, actually. I think it's a good time to do yeah, it. Certainly. That was very smooth, wasn't it? <laughs> it's I, should, it I should be on television, I am. Um, yeah, that, that cost about three pounds to make, that record. Uh... And we made it in one of these disused kind of small factories where they used to make cutlery. It was absolutely filthy. It had a partially working toilet. You know, it was like the filthiest place you could imagine. And uh, and we covered it all in... Um, to, to soundproof it, we covered it in... You know those trays that apples come in, right? We just got them from the, uh, the local greengrocers and put them all over the walls to dampen it down a bit. And uh, anyway, so we made this record. Somebody uh, uh, from Fast Records, which is an in, uh, independent record label at the time, post-punk. Um, and all the rest of their acts were like, you know, punk bands. And uh, the guy who um, sent it up there for us was also in a band called 2.3 from Sheffield. He said, oh, I'll send it to Bob Last. He might like it, you know. And I'm going, yeah, sure. Uh, so this very bad copy we copied onto an even worse cassette, sent it up there, and... Uh, he loved it. We made the, al- we made the uh, single cover artwork ourselves. We were always intent on keeping control 